New Hampshire's Operations Director. For guests who may be less familiar with us, the Northeast Organic Farming Association of New Hampshire is a nonprofit organization dedicated to educating farmers, gardeners, consumers, activists to help support New Hampshire's local organic farming community. We're one of the original state chapters of NOFA, and today we're seven chapters strong with branches across the Northeast. At the root of NOFA is land, people, and food. And we'd like to begin our program by acknowledging the first stewards of this land that we call New Hampshire today. Tonight's event is taking place on the land of the Penacook tribe, or Nadakina, the Abenaki word for the traditional ancestral homeland of the Abenaki and Wabanaki peoples past and present. NOFA New Hampshire acknowledges and honors with gratitude the Alnobak people who have stewarded this land and its waterways through the generations. Thank you. So tonight we're gathered to celebrate the many people who have nurtured this land and organization, our mission to help people build local, just, and sustainable food systems, and the organic and regenerative agriculture community as we move together into the future. There's so much to be thankful for, so I'll start with the heart of NOFA, farmers and food. First and foremost, we'd like to thank Colby Hill Inn and all the farms, tasting partners, and organizations who supplied such amazing food, drinks, and flowers for this event, showcasing the many flavors of summer and the overflowing bounty New Hampshire has to offer. <laughs> Our farm partners and tasting vendors, Moonlight Meadery, Nocchino, Canterbury Ale Works, and Grounding Stone Farm, made the local and organic focus of this event really shine. The 50th anniversary Nova beer, I hope you tried it, developed by Canterbury Ale Works with Grounding Stone Farms, fresh from the field blueberries, is a beautiful example of what local collaboration can look like. And everything's been delicious, I'm not surprised. I also want to thank our fantastic Board of Directors for leading this organization and guiding this event. Board President Julie Davidson, Vice President Carl Johnson, Treasurer Steve Ford, Secretary Edith Pucci Couchman, and Board Members Joan O'Connor, Bill Wardwell, Kate Jabrowski, and Rue Tolland. <laughs> NOFA staff made the dream of this evening a reality, and I want to thank my incredible colleagues for the tremendous effort they put into every last little teeny detail of this occasion. It's really been fantastic. Education Program Coordinator Kyle Jacoby, Marketing Communications Coordinator Shoshi Ketzelberry, and Finance and Bulk Order Coordinator Denise Rico. Thank you. <laughs> to have such a passionate and dedicated team of people directing this organization and I'd like to ask you all to stand if you could. That was, that was my hope. I know we all clap for you. Thank you for the chat. And finally, I would like to recognize and thank our generous sponsors for helping to make this evening possible and for their substantial support of our efforts through the years. Thank you to Stonyfield Organic, Pete and Jerry's Organic Eggs, Olivia's Organics, BCM Environmental and Land Law, Farm Credit East, Coast of Maine, Organic Valley, Vermont Compost Company, Taproot Magazine, and Cat Atra, Badger, Farm Aid, Revision Energy, Bonafide, Concord Food Co-op, Hanover Co-op Food Stores, Lakeview Organic Grain, Farm to Consumer Legal Defense Fund, and North Country Smokehouse. Thank you. And many of these organizations are here tonight. We hope you've had a chance to meet them and learn more about the good work they're doing in our community. And of course, this night wouldn't exist without you. We're truly thrilled, yes. We're truly thrilled to be celebrating NOFA's rich history, our work today, and our collective hopes for the future with such an amazing group. It's really 
wonderful. So by show of hands, um, who here has ever been a NOFA board member, a staff member, committee member, NOFA New Hampshire member, or volunteer? Please raise your hand. Looking at this room alone, we know that NOFA would not be here today without the dedication of so many people. People who are no longer with us. People who could not be here tonight. People who supported their partners, raised families, and participated in innumerable and unknowable ways to weave the intricate web that has led us here today. And I'd like to share just a little bit more of that history to set the stage for what's to come with the rest of our program. In June of 1971, Samuel came and convened the very first meeting of the Northeast Organic Farming Association on a hillside in Vermont, and NOFA was born. And that's, that's the meeting. <laughs> grown out of the, sorry about that, grown out of the back to the land movement, anti-war sentiment, environmental degradation, and civil unrest, NOFA attracted a vibrant group of young environmentalists and concerned citizens many of whom helped shape the organization over decades and are still with us today. Last year, we had the honor of interviewing some of the founders, early board members, and supporters of NOFA New Hampshire, including Samuel Kamen, who went on to found Stonyfield and remained full of zeal and life into his mid-80s. And sadly, Samuel passed away earlier this year. We wish he could have been here with us tonight. When early founders recalled some of their fondest memories of NOFA, many included Samuel, his inspiring workshops, his passion, how he would wake up conference goers by ringing a cowbell after long nights of stories around the campfire, and how he jokingly referred to NOFA as no fooling around. <laughs> and I'd like to introduce Paul Dosher now to say a few more words about Samuel. Paul was NOFA New Hampshire's board president in the 1980s he worked with Samuel through NOFA in the Rural Education Center and continues to operate Wincrest Farm. Thank you, Paul, for being here. So, how many of you folks in the room knew Samuel? Raise your hand. A few. A few. How many took a course or a workshop with Samuel? Raise your hand. Just a few. Um, raise your hand if you work with him at any particular point in time. Anybody? Oh my god, well we got we have at least one. You might want to come up here and give this talk then. <laughs> You're the legacy. <laughs> well I'll do my best and hope that those of you who knew Samuel will agree with my observations. I really don't recall when I met Samuel. It might have been 1975 or 1976. It's all kind of a blur in that way. Um, I also don't recall why he asked me to join the board of the Rural Education Center when he founded it in 1979. At the time, I was newly married, my lovely wife over here, Deb, and I was teaching environmental science here at New England College in Henniger, and beginning a search for land where Deb and I could start a small organic farm, uh, which we did find. But apparently Samuel valued my insights because he asked me to be on the board along with a number of other more eloquent and, and, and chief and oriented people than I was. Trek was, as we called it, was Samuel's passion and his mission. It was created on a small hillside farm, Stonyfield Farm, in Wilton, and was designed to bring the lessons and message of organic farming and gardening to a wider audience. It did that in large part because of Samuel's larger-than-life personality. Over the course of the five or six years that Trek was in existence, they, they tallied about 10,000 people participating in a workshop or a course or a class that was run by the Rural Education Center. Some of you will remember the name Jake Guest, another NOFA pioneer. And he once said, quote, Samuel didn't know what he was doing, but he got a lot done. <laughs> he wasn't shy told us we were going to save the world. I recall someone at the time saying that Samuel's personality could be described as manic charismatic. 
having looked up definitions of manic, it's not always a complimentary word. So let's focus on the charismatic part. There are seven characteristics often listed to describe someone who's charismatic. Number one, confidence. Samuel demonstrated that in spades. Number two, vision. Again, this was Samuel to a T. Determination. Again, Samuel all the way. Clear communication. He was, without question, a gifted communicator. And five and six, creativity, and finally, adaptability. And here's where I have a little story. One of the things I observed was that Samuel loved the teaching, the inventing, the fixing of broken things, and the starting of new projects. But he wasn't particularly fond of writing reports and grant proposals, which you got to do if you run a nonprofit organization. At a point in 1983, he managed to lure an old friend from the New Alchemy Institute named Gary Hirschberg to come to track and take those tasks on in the management and administration of the program. He turned his attention to more fully to finding a new farm enterprise that he thought could provide the economic resources to give track a financial footing to carry it forward into the future. I recall at one board meeting, we were all sitting together at Stonyfield Farm in the kitchen, where we were conversing before the meeting started, and Samuel came in with a big smile on his face, carrying jars and asking us if we would try this new idea. As some know, Samuel loved hot food. I mean, really hot food. And his new idea was a canned hot pepper. And he was enthusiastic about the whole idea and handed it to us all and asked us to try it for our reactions. It took less than a minute. In short, the advice of Samuel was a consensus. If we are to fund Trek Samuel with a farm enterprise, you need to keep looking <laughs> Creativity and adaptability. Sammy went back to his creative laboratory, wherever that was and whatever he did. And the next meeting, the idea was, let's create an all-natural organic yogurt right here on the farm. Later that year, Samuel took leave from his duties running Trek and put his full efforts into the yogurt works. I can remember a couple of days helping him pound these, those big, uh, I don't know what you call them, plastic sheets on the wall to make sure the place was sterile. Um, and it was, believe me, it was an old rickety barn and there was no right angles anywhere in it, so it was an interesting challenge putting it together. So, at that point, Gary took over the operations of Trek and Stonyfield went on and the rest is history and I don't need to repeat the story of Stonyfield. Finally, I'll read some excerpts from Samuel's obituary, which captures who he was better than anything I could possibly say. I'll quote, to know and work with Samuel was to be inspired forever forward. He had an infectious way about him, harnessing the inspiration that ran through him like a fast flowing river. His genius spilled forth and the rest of the world sprinted to keep up. He gave passionately and with abandon to every endeavor and everyone he encountered. His brilliance, his heart, his life and work leave an indelibly profound mark on this earth and upon the people he met, knew and loved. His reach was wide, his impact was deep, and his spirit lives on in the countless individuals around the globe who claim he changed my life. I am one of those, and I'm sure many of you are as well. Thank you so much, Paul. That was wonderful and really speaks to the spirit that Samuel brought to NOFA and to the many inspired people who are here with us and have been through the years. And thank you again. We're so grateful to all the dedicated individuals who grew at NOFA through both prosperous and difficult years, who helped to write the organic certification standards in New Hampshire, who advocated, farmed, and educated, all while keeping at the center of their work, food, fun, and the community they hoped to shape and serve. And we're honored to carry on this legacy. 
And now I'd like to introduce Julie Davidson, president of Nova New Hampshire's board of directors to share her vision for the future of organic agriculture in New Hampshire and beyond. Thank you, Julie. Thank you, Nikki. I want to take a second first to recognize Nikki um, uh, for her steadfast leadership of NOFA New Hampshire. So if everybody could just give her a round of applause. I didn't have the privilege of knowing Samuel, but I am deeply grateful for the work of Samuel and all the founders of in this movement from the early days. Um, I was watching some of the videos recently. If you haven't checked out the documentary on NOFA New Hampshire's history, I highly recommend it. It's um, really powerful, and I think Woodstock gets all the credit for being the cool movement in, you know, the, what was it, the 1970s? I don't even know what Woodstock was, really, but that <laughs> gathering of NOFA, I think, was the real movement. Um, what drew me to join the board of NOFA New Hampshire was the, the relationships and connections that NOFA fosters to the soil, to the land, and the food that is produced from the land, to the people who grew it in our local communities, as witnessed here tonight at tonight's gathering. Um, restoring and strengthening these connections has always been at the heart of NOFA's values. What we value and when we value and when we cultivate these relationships, we are nurturing the soil mycelium that is necessary to restore the health of the communities and the planet. The values that NOFA was founded on are fundamental to supporting not only healthy soup, soil and food, but life. The values that drove founders like Samuel to form NOFA are more relevant today than in 1971 which happens to be my birth year, by the way, so 50 years has passed, and the organic movement has always been inherently a social, political, and environmental movement, one that seeks food justice, sovereignty, and dignity, as well as nurturing the health and soil of all the life that emerges from it. Our work takes on new meaning and urgency, as in the face of climate change, ongoing systemic racism, and the pervasive colonization mindset of our governing bodies, corporations, and society in general today that are accelerating this degradation. NOFA's vision for the future echoes the vision of its founding members, offering an alternative vision, one that is built on the principles of health, ecology, fairness, and care. NOFA New Hampshire, along with our seven sister states, Chapters have worked to develop principles to guide our work for the Farm Bill and also deep transformation of our food system. I missed that part up. But um, <laughs> successfully incorporating these principles will result in all food that is produced is using organic and agroecological principles, practices, practices that are a core solution to our climate crisis. We no longer have a need for certification programs because all food is produced in a manner that supports soil health, animal welfare, food justice, and equity. Farmers are thriving from the fair treatment and just livelihoods enabled by deep transformations in our food system. Racial justice is achieved across all levels of the food system, repairing the past and ongoing harm. There is abundance for all. Food insecurity is eliminated through food sovereignty initiatives such as land access, adoption of organic practices, seed sovereignty, farmland preservation, worker-owned cooperatives, and more. Our soil, water, and air are clean and pure, and the food we eat and environments we live in are void of any toxic substances. And our rural communities are thriving again as a result of a food system that is decentralized with an emphasis on regional food supply webs, not chains, that break up the consolidation of agriculture and food production. This vision emerges from 50 years of experience cultivating a community of farmers, eaters, and land stewards. NOFA is uniquely positioned to help lead efforts to transform our food system. We have the experience, membership-based collective wisdom and partners, many of which are here tonight. I've worked with so many of you on different policies and um, projects. Uh, 
And some of our recent successful initiatives that are paving the way toward this vision include the recent adoption of the soil health legislation that was passed in the state of New Hampshire in 2021. Um, Roger and Britt and Sarah, who all here tonight were part of that group that moved forward that legislation. Also the introduction of the Farm to School Bill in this past legislative session. It didn't pass, but we're going back again. Join us, please. Fostering peer-to-peer -peer learning among farmers, homesteaders, and gardeners through our craft programs and winter conference. Expanding food access by helping to found the New Hampshire Feeding New Hampshire program along with the New Hampshire Food Alliance here tonight providing access to fresh food through our statewide farm share program, now in its sixth year, and promoting equity and social justice at every level of the food system, and working with our partners to build a regional, decentralized, and resilient food system. Wendell Berry, in his essay, The Pleasure of Eating, describes eating as an agricultural act. Yet, most people are industrial eaters today, disconnected from the land and the food it produced. He further states, both eater and the eaten are thus an exile from biological reality. We passively participate in our food system. The problems facing our food system are complex, yet the solutions can be simple. With each meal you eat, you have the ability to ignite transformation in our food system. In closing of that essay, Wendell Berry reminds us that eating with the fullest pleasure is perhaps the profound most profound enactment of our connection with the world. So NOFA cultivates these connections between eater with farming and the land, creating a sense of connection and stewardship that is necessary in transforming our food system. We invite you all to continue on this journey of building a good food system and by becoming a member, um, supporting our education events, volunteering on our committee or board, um, just reaching out to us, to, we, we'd love to hear what your thoughts are and ways we can move forward with this vision. Um, it's a collective vision, and like I said, it was built on 50 years of NOFA New Hampshire. And so with that, I'm really excited to invite up all of our panelists tonight who are local agricultural leaders to share the many ways they are enacting this vision and paving the way. So with that, I'd also like to, to invite up Kyle. Yeah, you can take one. I'll move out of the way. Well, I can't do the mic down low. <laughs> we just have a couple of things to accomplish in our state, but we do have some wonderful people here, which is great, and we thought we would hear from them and hopefully get inspired, and I think we have a lot of inspiring things here this evening, So, uh, but I want to do less talking. And before I do that, though, I do want to introduce our panel this evening. So we have Dave Chapman. Dave, you can wait to Dave. Co-founder. Yes, please. Co-founder and co-director of the Real Organic Project and farmer at Long Wind Farm, a longtime organic farmer from Vermont, a founding member of the Vermont Organic Farmers. He still runs Long Wind Farm. He served on the USDA Hydroponic Organic Task Force. He has organized a number of rallies to protest the erosion of integrity in the National Organic Program. And Dave was a co-founder of Keep the Soil and Organic and the Real Organic Project, where he is currently co-director. Yay. Anthony, and Anthony, I do not want to butcher your last name, so I haven't heard you say it, so how do you pronounce your last name? Manny. Manny, great. Um, and uh, Anthony is with ORIS, which is the uh, organization for Refugee and Immigrant Success and Fresh Start Farms, and is the New American Sustainable Agriculture Program Program Director. And Anthony began as uh, the NASAP Farm Manager in 2013, and he develops and implements management plans, as well as infrastructure development for multiple farm sites, 
He coordinates land use, provides production training and technical assistance for the participants. In addition to growing up on a family farm, he owns a permaculture farm in Kenya and has vast experience in the agricultural sector from incubator farms to greenhouse production to project management for a farm to restaurant program and graduated from the Kenya Institute of Organic Agriculture in the Uganda, mm, I would mispronounce that as well, Martyrs? Martyrs University. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> I think I, I, I was close. So, Anthony. And over there we have Hannah. Flanders, <laughs> co-founder, director of marketing and communication at the Kiosark Food Hub. Yeah. Yeah. And Hannah Flanders is a co-founder of the Kiosark Food Hub, a small nonprofit working to reinvigorate community within a restorative local food system based pretty much right next door in Bradford, New Hampshire. And she currently serves as the director of marketing and communication for the Food Hub and actively uh, invites the community to participate. As we know, we just were there on Wednesday with the Congresswoman, which was wonderful. Um, and participate, oh, well, that was in our local food system, but in our local community uh, and organization's growth and development on many levels. She is passionate about relationship building, storytelling, creating connections to cultivate a richer, more fulfilling, and secure experience for all people. And we're glad to have you in here as well. Well, we invited uh, all three of them to begin with uh, a few minutes to just have their own introductory statement. So, they're the closest to me, so I'm going to hand the mic to you. Thanks, Kai. He, he actually was a little more leading in his instructions for what I was supposed to do here. <laughs> so, uh, why should we be hopeful about the next 50 years of agriculture? and uh, local food systems in New England. And um, I am seldom called upon to be optimistic. <laughs> I am mostly Davy Downer. But um, to, to address that at all, I had the honor of uh, interviewing Michael Pollan a year ago. And I asked him, Michael, are, are things getting better or are they getting worse? And he gave a really interesting answer. He said, well, there's an awareness that is growing uh, and a food movement that is building that is much greater than 10 years earlier when he wrote The Omnivore's Dilemma. And uh, so that's really exciting. At the same time, the actual food system is getting much worse. And everything is becoming more and more consolidated and owned by fewer and fewer players. And that's true in production, it's true in distribution, it's true in distribute, you know, in the stores and the retail. So um, it was kind of a sweet and sour answer. Um, and, but I think it's a true answer. And I, I've been puzzled by it. I didn't even know how to make sense of it because we see all these small farms growing and, um, you know, CSAs and farmers markets and these things that when I started farming, they hadn't even invented CSAs yet. I graduated from high school in 1971, so I'm even older. Um, and uh, so there's something really important that's happening, and it's very relevant to the existence of NOFA. NOFA really began in New Hampshire. Um, I know Jake Guest very well. He was my first teacher of farming, and he described going to Samuel and learning from him early, early days. And so much grew out of that. NOFAs are all over the Northeast now, different chapters. Back then it was just one. Um, and what we are doing in NOFA is so important, but it's not over at all, and it's barely begun, and we haven't won. Uh, and in, in many fronts we are losing. And I am not optimistic, but I am hopeful. So let's go with the hope tonight and, and say that as we do what we do together, I, I, we do create change. Change is, is happening. Um, the, the odds against us are actually great. 
the forces are great, and the same forces that we have inside us, you know, fear and greed. And um, I, got, I got plenty of both. So, uh, but I think that the mission of NOFA is more important than ever. Once again, my name is Anthony. I have an accent from Kenya, so I was born in Kenya, and I grew up on a family farm. And after high school, I attended an agriculture college in Kenya, and then I moved uh, for internship in Germany, where I learned a lot of agriculture management, and then came to U.S. Um, I have been working with Organization for Refugee and Immigrant Success for the last 10 years, on and off. Um, I took two years off to go back home and establish something which was not here on my heart, and that was a permaculture farm, uh, so that I could create um, a demonstration or um, become kind of a mentor to my community. Um, and then I came back to the U.S. and over the last four years, so I worked for all this establishing farm here in New Hampshire for five years. I took off and I came back in 2018. And I think every question we have today, I relate it. I relate every question with my story because um, it's a different story as a, a farmer of car in New Hampshire. And um, I tend to think and start to think about um, land access, to be able to feed our population. How and what are we going to do to feed um, our population? How are you going to increase the capacity of the food production? Which generation is going to increase the food capacity? Is it the same generation or the new generation? And then both of the question which Nick sent me is asking, how can we uh, include the young people? to join the agriculture so that when the new generation come and goes, there are new generations. So, um, it, it took me time to think, how do I respond to this question? But I connect them to my story. And I am very hopeful for that in the next 50 years in New England, uh, Having organization like NOVA, we will be able to bring in young generation to increase the food production capacity. We are going, I'm hopeful that we will be able to bring in new generation through new agriculture technologies using climate smart climate smart agriculture to be able to adapt to climate change. Um, because that's the only way I see, maybe I might be wrong, but that's the only way I see young generation when my son asks me, oh, you want me to go and turn on the, um, the drip irrigation? No, Dad, why don't you just use your phone? Why don't you come over? You know, that, and I'm thinking like, if I, um, like pass over my farm, All right, which is a story we're going to talk about later. How do I, when if I pass over my farm to my son, he's already like I can't do it, you know. And and that how 
that the generation we are trying to build, he is really leaning toward climate smart. He's leaning to technology to do the farming, to produce food. So I am very hopeful for that. Um, we can all work together with all the organizations and all the agencies to be able to extend our season, to be able to really um, become climate resilient, to produce food, and also to really uh, smartly uh, create new generation for um, food production. That's my hope for the next 50 years for new land. Thank you, I still feel like that new generation. <laughs> um, I really can't believe I'm sitting on this panel. <laughs> I really can't believe I'm even in this room. It feels so nourishing to be amongst each and every person in this room that in one way or another we are investing our energy and our lifeblood into the hope that we can make things better. And I thank everybody for being here. Um, really it feels like just yesterday I was digging in the dirt with a few of my friends over there from Lauren and Pierre, <laughs> by the post office in Bradford. And everyone's like, what are they doing? <laughs> and we were planting onions is the answer to that question. Thousands of onions by hand. And we were building a farm stand. And we were reaching out to many of you in this room, farmers, friends now, colleagues now, feels crazy going to Dave Trumbull's farm and helping him harvest the most giant beets we've ever seen. <laughs> because we just were eager to soak in the knowledge and learn from the web and the depth of this community. And I feel like a baby <laughs> in my infancy on this panel amongst you all. Um, because the truth is, it is about the generational exchange. And we all have a place, and there is no hierarchy. And we all have a lot to learn from one another. And NOFA being 50 years old is wild. And all of the work of all of the founders and everyone still involved has set the stage for what we have been able to do in partnership, the Food Hub. Um, for those of you who don't know the Kearsarge Food Hub that I'm representing, um, we're a very young nonprofit. We run a small organic regenerative farm. We have a market where we aggregate from over 100 partnering vendors from throughout the state and beyond. We have a new cafe where we try to craft meals lovingly with seasonal ingredients, which is way easier said than done. Right, team? <laughs> <laughs> and all the while, we're channeling all these fruits to neighbors who can't afford to shop at the market. We are bringing kiddos to the farm and helping them find their place in nature and in community. And none of these ideas are new at all. I must acknowledge the land that we're on and the gratitude that we have at the Food Hub for our partnership with our Abenaki neighbors and the leadership they provide in how to steward this land with gratitude and love and care. Sherry and Bill are here tonight. <laughs> so I guess I, say, I, I will say that feeling like a baby on the stage amongst you all is not a bad thing. On Sweet Beet Farm, we believe in succession planting. And that is when one bed of arugula is going to seed, the next one is coming out fresh. And that's what we're committed to do. The sun will shine every day, and we can't control the outcome, but we can, we can show up and we can water the fields. Thank you. Thank you, all three of you, for your words. Much appreciated. So we have a few prepared questions for each of them. They all have their own question, and then if there's some time, maybe we'll have a couple lingering ones, but they will all have so, Dave, you are 
definitely involved in organic agriculture, so we thought a great question for you is, why is organic agriculture important to our future? Why is it significant? When NOFA was started, um, organic was obviously a movement. It was a political, social movement, and it was about creating an alternative to uh, a system, a world uh, in our country that that was mired in a war, and and. Um, for a lot of the wrong reasons. So, I had a conversation with a, somebody who was on the board of California Certified Organic Farmers, which is a big organization out there, and we talked for a long time about hydroponics and organic, and at the end of it he said, you know, I really envy you in the Northeast because you still, you know, believe in organic. It's still a movement for you. Out here, it's really become a business. And I don't think that that's entirely true. There are plenty of people in California, farmers and eaters, very, very many, for whom it's a movement. But it's a huge business out there, and that, that can easily drown out the conversation. I think that all the reasons that we believed in that movement 50 years ago, I know some of us weren't born then, so, you know, but, but that movement continues and grows, and I think all those reasons still exist of why it's important. And it's important that we have a decentralized economic system. It's important that we have food that's grown without poison. It's food. important that we have food that's grown in soil that actually makes true nourishment in that food. Um, I think it's important that we raise animals in a truly humane way. I think it's important that we treat each other, and the people who work on the farms, and the people who work in the truck that gets to the farm, and the people who work in the stores in a, in a respectful and humane way. And these are the, the foundational timbers of the organic movement, and I think that they're just as important as they ever were. Things have gotten maybe more complicated out there, and the, the the very things that, that we were fighting for uh, very similar to what we're fighting for for real democracy. We're fighting for real organic, and they're not so different. So um, I, I think for sure we need to grow food that is not toxic and not sprayed with poisons. And that's the most simplistic version of organic. But it goes much deeper than that, and I know that the people here are connected to that, and that's what we need to keep working on together. I'll say one last little story, and then I'll be quiet. Uh, when we were starting the Real Organic Project, and I've told this before, but uh, there's a farmer I really respect in Oklahoma, and I was talking with her about the Real Organic Project, and we were imagining it as a northern New England movement, you know, Vermont and New Hampshire and Maine. And she said, Dave, Vermont can do this without Oklahoma, but Oklahoma can't do it without Vermont. And, and I, when she said Vermont, she meant New Hampshire too. So, <laughs> you know, and I think it's true that, that we have the community, we have the network here, and many of the problems that they, that they deal with in California just don't exist here. So we do have a, a kind of privilege of living in a different kind of community in a different environment where it actually rains. So, you know, but, but they don't just need us, we need them too. If there's anything that we've learned from climate is that we're all connected and that it, it, it ain't fixed until it's all fixed. So, um, I can't remember if I answered the question, but I think that's good. <laughs> If anyone here is unaware of the Real Organic Project, they do a lot of great, amazing things, and we're really glad to have everyone here, and, and David's really glad to have you here, too, so. Um, great. So, Anthony, we thought a great question for you, because you're involved in a program that tries to cultivate and, and grow 
farmers and, and provide great access to, uh, to farming. So we thought a great question for you would be how can we support the current and new farmers in the state to make New Hampshire an enticing place to farm? Great, thank you. Um, again, I will read the question to my story. Uh, Orange, which is the Organization for Refugee and Migrant Success, has a program called the NASAP, and the NASAP means New Sustainable Agriculture Project uh, Program. Uh, that's the program I'm reading. And we have four incubator sites. Okay. So we have a farm in Boston, New Hampshire. We have two sites in Concord, uh, which are owned by St. Paul House Schools, uh, High Schools. St. Paul High Schools own 2,000 acres, so they were generous enough to allow us uh, as use a couple of their uh, farmland. And we also um, bought 54 acres in Dumbarton, so we have four incubator sites. <laughs> so it has only been possible to have uh, a group of uh, farmers I'm working with to do the farming by coming together. The reason is it is very expensive, as you all know, as um, a young or a new farmer uh, trying to start a farm business. And I will tell you the starting cost <laughs> can run up to $60,000 because um, currently we are establishing a new site which is still at St. Paul High School and we have to put a loan, an access loan for $20,000. We had to uh, drill a well 1,000 feet, that costed us $25,000, okay? And then we had to bring in electricity. When you calculate all that, it's becoming about $60,000. And we do not have the fence yet, so it's very expensive. And how we navigate that is through having um, this incubator farm, whereby many farmers are coming together and having an access to the land and the infrastructure. And then from there, um, over the year we will be able, and most farmers will be able either to stick with the farming or find another path. So, um, to the question, I believe that having incubator farm for every, it doesn't matter where you come from, would you really create um, a space for everyone to, um, to, to be able to try? Because $60,000, 8000 for a new uh, young farmer is a lot of money. But if you have a, a, a land, Nikki, you have a 10 acres of land, with access road and electricity and water, that way you'll be able possibly to figure out uh, who is willing to move on and uh, build a farm business. I also believe that um, uh, it is very important to have um, a program whereby we link uh, and I know you do, Guy. Uh, for example, in Nova, we have that problem. I haven't uh, checked of late whether it's still going on, whereby you link the most successful farmer, like a mentorship uh, program, and uh, an intensive mentorship program where you link me with Dave, who is a very experienced farmer with seedlings, and I learn from him. And I will tell you as a story, just a mini story, that. When I moved to New Hampshire, I worked with Renju on the farm, which is located in Morton Paul, and he trained me how to assemble and build greenhouse. He trained me how, which varieties are best for New Hampshire, and which variety you are going to be success if you are doing a farm business. 
and it took to me two years to learn all that. And that's why, um, although I worked for all these two years ago, I bought a 50 acre farm here in Endover, personal farm, through a program I'm going to discuss through another question. But my, my point is, learn through a program, through an experienced farmers. Because if you don't learn, then you mess up. And once you mess up, you quit. And again, it bring me back to young generation. If you give up in the middle, then we will have a very big gap of generation of farming. And my last um, point would be uh, having uh, micro um, grants for young farmers who want, who are willing now after the step of they have gone through those steps and if they are willing to start farming, they are able to access some kind of a micro grant to be able to support them to start farming because again it's very expensive and uh, out of experience I wouldn't think that um, it, it, you know you will go to the bank to borrow uh, among buying the farm and the mobiles to borrow eight thousand dollars to start a farm business. You know, so uh, having micro grants to support young farmers would be great. This program is, is great and everything they're doing, and they're actually our neighbors, and they're so building their new facility. So, got to stop out there, and it's really coming along, and I'm excited for that. Uh, and Hannah, because you've been involved in starting a, an amazing program, and with all of those people over there, comments are the question we thought would be great for you would be where do you think New Hampshire can be a leader in New England and in the United States, um, or some of the programs we could? really grow here in the state? Thank you. That's a tough one. I've been pondering it a lot because I've been thinking about how leadership can come at many levels. And if you look maybe at our statewide policy level, you might not see a whole lot of leadership in this realm. But if you peek beneath the surface, and you look to the grassroots of it all, including NOFA as a tremendous leader, you find a whole lot of heart based in the people that are doing the work on the ground, like most of you here tonight. Um, I have been fortunate to forge relationships um, through the Food Hub and with my team uh, in the community relating to all sorts of amazing programs that demonstrate leadership. Um, for one, I will say that New Hampshire has over 4,100 small farms. We are a small farm state. And when we just had our listening session with Congresswoman Custer, and she's speaking to the Farm Bill, the interest represented in that bill, though we can have a lot of hope that our interest will also be there, though it is not, are representing large monoculture conglomerate farms uh, in Midwestern states. They are not representing our state. And so where New Hampshire can be a leader is representing small farms, speaking up, listening to our farmers, listening to their needs, communicating them, supporting them. Our farmers are having a really tough time. We all know that because many of us are farmers. And they need our support because they're growing our food. Not only that, they're nourishing our soils and our waters and our lands. And New Hampshire can be a leader in vocalizing on behalf of our small farms. And someone spoke to the, the growth of the direct-to-consumer markets that we've had here uh, in New Hampshire, and it has been tremendous. Really creative ways of farmers reaching their communities, farmers markets, CSAs, co-ops, all of these avenues that maintain the story of the food and actually represent the value that went into producing that food. And New Hampshire can be a leader in working toward fair compensation for all farm workers, all food producers, all along the supply chain. It's something that our team has been working incredibly hard on doing uh, at the Kearsarge Food Hub and the not so sexy behind the scenes work of paying our farmers and managing our budgets, done by Lauren and France and our team behind the scenes. Um, that work is really important. 
And then I come in as kind of a communicator, a bridge, and I try to communicate to the people why our food costs so much at Sweet Beet Market. And I try to say, the food you find in the grocery store is falsely cheap. And if you knew what went into it, you would not want to buy it. But the truth is, we have many, many neighbors that do not have the luxury of even questioning how much their food costs. It has to be the cheapest thing they can get because full bellies are better than not. And so New Hampshire I'm seeing is a leader in creative ways of merging the need to support farmers with the need to feed our people. Um, at the Cures Farge Food Hub, we have a program where we, we are a nonprofit, so we fundraise and we funnel those dollars to purchase. Last year, we spent over $60,000 purchasing food directly from farmers and distributing them to food pantries. And the New Hampshire Feeding New Hampshire program with NOFA and New Hampshire Food Alliance is the same kind of model. Really important programs. Um, another program that I think is so crucial is is deeper than feeding people, is using food as a tool for healing, for cultural rejuvenation. Um, the Abenaki Seeds Project is something we're incredibly grateful to have been a part of. And like many of the good systems that kind of make their way to New Hampshire, it kind of started in Vermont, and that's okay. Uh, <laughs> because being a leader also means listening to good ideas. Um, and with the Abenaki Seeds Project, we've partnered and supported our, our partners at the Abenaki Trails Project to distribute their heritage seeds this year to 40 growers in our region who have been experimenting with growing Three Sisters crops, and then we'll use our food hub distribution channels to get those back to the food pantry, the Abenaki Helping Abenaki Food Pantry, um, as well as displaying them and sharing them and enjoying them at a harvest dinner on October 10th through the Hopkinton Historical Society. And it is these kinds of relationships based on the people, based on our land, where we are leaders. There is no place like this place. There are no people like New Hampshire people. Live free or die, baby. <laughs> That's right. We have a certain grit, a certain we'll get it done vibe, and we're living within the limits and the gifts of the seasons and of this land. We have an immense opportunity here in New Hampshire. We have all the seasons. We have mountains, lakes, rivers, streams, meadows, oceans. We can demonstrate what it means to live within the limits of our natural landscape, to listen to nature, to listen to each other, and to feed each other not only food, but something a, a little bit deeper than that. So, thank you. Thank you, Hannah. I think we got time for one more, but if we could keep it short and sweet response, it would be wonderful. <laughs> Hannah says no. I want you to get the grit in you to get a short and sweet response. Maybe we can do that again. Yeah. <laughs> but I think maybe we can end on a, an inspiring note um, before we uh, let our panel go back to their seats and maybe just. Anything currently happening in New Hampshire that you are excited about, or anything happening locally or in your work that you are uh, definitely excited about? Well, I'm excited that the Real Organic Project now has 1,100 farms certified across the U.S. <laughs> in four short years from nothing, and it's not that we did anything amazing, it's that the farms are there, and I believe that the eaters are there, and we just need to be a matchmaker and bring the eaters and the farmers together. Um, a lot of food that's sold as organic isn't, in my opinion, and a lot of food that isn't certified as organic is. But, but the point isn't about a label, the point is about how we grow our food. One thing I wanted to say that I didn't say, it was kind of killingly obvious, was, why is organic uh, important for the future is obviously climate change. Yeah. And there's a lot of talk about regenerative agriculture going to save us. And some of what's called regenerative is regenerative, but some of it isn't, just like with organic. And I think real organic is regenerative, and it is the right answer for everything that we need to do. So. Yeah. Thank you. So I. Um, 
I am very um, excited and about what excites me about New Hampshire is that um, there are very many people who are willing um, to who are in, in the food system and they are really willing to make sure that uh, they pass on uh, the generation, their generation to the other generation of young people and this I'm talking about the people with the farmland because um, it's very very important uh, I was able to buy my farm because someone value food and agriculture and, and the system of the, the local food and that someone puts her farm on um, easement programs to be able to make the farms affordable. So I am really excited and I'm very happy to see that trend in New Hampshire and as an offer um, being a leader of um, organic farm organization in New Hampshire, I'm hoping that we can continue possibly reaching as many people and getting as many members as we can and that member can um, Become access uh, to the young generation so that they can pass their farm to the young generations. So I'm really, um, I'm really happy about that. That there are very many people there willing to put their farm into easement to make them affordable to the young generations. Because that way, and that the only way. I personally, and also the organization I work with, we were able to uh, have the land access because without the land access, then we're not able to grow the food. So that is very special to me. I'm feeling similarly hopeful about the movement of young people into this realm of food production and all along the food system. Um, we started as six founders of the Food Hub. We now have 25 paid employees, uh, six board members, and even more volunteers. Um, one cool example of how people can find their place in the, in the food system or in this work is we have um, Cameron here tonight. I don't know if they're out there, but um, they're there. Uh, Cameron started working with us a couple years ago in the market, could have been amazing at any job in the food hub, um, and became passionate about local food because of our, our work, um, all of our collective community work, and just be, being a part of this community. Uh, we were sad to see them go, but now they're working for Vital Communities uh, as a project manager, helping people access resources for a meaningful and healthy life, um, including but not limited to food. So that is a success story that makes me feel incredibly hopeful. Um, and let's do more of that. Hey, welcome. Before we are done, I would like to invite you all on October 20th. We have uh, an event at uh, St. Paul High School. And I will send the link to Nikki. So in a couple of weeks, you can check it out. And it uh, will, the event will be focusing on climate, uh, climate smart, I don't know whether yeah. it's the term terminology <laughs> um, that you're calling it, but we are really working very hard to put up uh, together a demonstration practices on climate smart agriculture for, so that we can demonstrate um, resilient practices uh, and be able to adopt on climate change. Thank you. I want to thank our panel for coming up here and sharing their words. It's great. You all can go back to your seat. Thank you, Dave. Well, what inspiring words. Um, NOFA New Hampshire has had a little bit of an inspiring week. Wednesday with the Congresswoman and then celebrating our 50th. So I think we are on a, uh, 
a high of uh, motivation and hopeful and excitement, so a lot of great energy around so many things. And there's so many wonderful people uh, in this room, and Nikki thanked a lot of them, and we're really glad that everyone could come this evening and, and support with your, uh, with your time and, and many things, and um, so we're just we're really grateful. And I do need to amend something. Uh, we did not put Sweet Beef Farm. They did donate food. So, I know, they let me know. I put them on the board. So, <laughs> it's not in the uh, little handout, and I can't go and edit all of them. So, I have to verbally say it that Sweet Beef gave some food. And we're grateful for that.